Fuck Harry. <laughs> John Randall was a friend of Greg Bennett's. Greg Bennett worked with me in those days. In fact, Greg did a lot of work on that, on that six-ring bass. His name was never mentioned either in that article. And Greg worked with me for a while. He was a great woodworker. And uh, when a lot of things came up on the bass, I had said, hey, Ray, you think, I mean, Greg, do you think we can do this? And he said, well, let's see what we can do. You know, he had a lot of input in, into making that bass. You know. um, It's just ironic that none of that stuff, a major magazine like that that's going to do an article on the six-string bass, never really talked about the six-string bass. They talked about Anthony Jackson and all the stuff he did. Well, as far as I'm concerned, he didn't do all that much. Um, I got this track of what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, John Randall, that, I was going to talk about John. Because I look back at my dad, way back when I was a kid, he says, you know, Carl, if, uh, if we could uh, take the stereo system and put it inside a guitar, you know, back in those days, my dad had a Macintosh preamp and a Marantz power amplifier all of this high high quality equipment, but it was all tube. There were no transistors, there was no none of that stuff in those days. But the effect he was talking about was his thoughts on, on, on the on the passive circuit, which he didn't even call it a passive circuit. That term didn't even come in until much later on. It was just a circuit. <laughs> and the way he looked at it, you had a pickup and you had a volume control. And he had so much gain. And he always said, anytime you add something, you also subtract something. So you add a tone control, and right away you start losing some of the output from the pickup. Not a lot, but enough. And I'm talking about another time. I'm talking about not having the cell phone. It's, it's a whole other time. You know, um, it just didn't exist. And my dad said, if we could do that, you could separate. You could have a preamp where you, you could keep the signal as strong as it was from the get-go. So you had the volume, and you put a tone control in, and a, a, not just a tone control, but a bass control and a treble control separate. Just like you have on, a, on the stereo systems back in the 50s. You know, uh, I still have all that stuff, by the way. My dad, when my dad passed away, my mother gave all that stuff to me. I have all those, all those things. But of course, you couldn't pick up all that stuff and put it in a little compartment like that. You know. But you know, we're in the '70s, and that stuff still did The preamp still didn't exist. But Greg Bennett's friend John Randall was an electronics engineer. And I said, I said, John, because I remember what my dad said about that. You know. And now transistors are in and a few other things, which I don't understand. I'm not even getting into that. John did understand it. I said, John, I'm making the six-string bass, and I know I'm not going to get the low end right. We've already got problems. Maybe, is it possible? Like I told him the story about my dad saying, if you could put this thing inside here, you know, it would be cool. Well, you could add and subtract, you might be able to help. And, and John had some experience with, you know, doing things like that. He said, well, I'll, I'll give it a try, Carl, and see what happens. You know? So he tried. He made a little preamp. Because you couldn't, you, you have to understand, you couldn't go out to the guitar center and say, I want an EMG BTS control. It did not exist. It didn't exist. John made something. It was a little noisy and it wasn't quite, it was like a little high frequency noise that he couldn't seem to get rid of. And, it, you know, but it did separate things and it was, it was something. It was the first time. And I appreciate what John did, you know. It was, again, in that article, no mention of any of that. 
And probably the reason was because Mr. Jackson didn't even know that John Randall even existed, probably. There was somebody there who was trying to help me help him. No mention. Oh, yeah, hey, of course I was mad at Anthony. I could probably said a lot. You know what? A lot of people who do things, who really do things, usually have another side to them. I think I'm a pretty nice person. I'm easy to get along with. But there's another side. Frank Sinatra, I remember Frank Sinatra talking about that. He had, you know, there's somebody who spent his whole life really trying to do things. He really did it. But he had another side, you know. You get crazy trying to do it. And sometimes when you've got people fighting you, if you're in a gridlock situation, you get a little bit on the other side. You know? And that's probably where I was when Anthony Jackson walked in that day, you know, so, yeah. But the fact is, I busted my butt trying to do that, and there was no mention of that. Or you wanted a wider space, and so did I. And I could make a wider space, and that wasn't a problem. Now, how are we going to pick it up? And believe me, I called people. I finally got Attila Zola. No mention of Attila Zola in that article either. Legendary guitar. I would have been proud to have Attila Zola try to make a pickup for me, you know. He was a legendary jazz guitar player who made pickups for Honer, Schaller, a whole bunch of people. Uh, in fact, uh, my favorite jazz pickup for my, for my taste is, is a pickup made by Shadow Company, and Attila Zola designed that. In fact, he had a whole series where he had his name, where they took the name off and just called it the Zola Pickup Show. And when I talked to Attila, because he was a friend of mine, I worked, I played with Attila many times, you know. And there's something too, don't you think about that. Yeah. A little nobody guitar player from Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, getting to know someone like Attila Zola, or not just getting to know him, but fixing his guitars for him, doing fretwork for him, and actually playing gigs with him. Huh. You think that doesn't touch me? It does. No mention of him at all. And he tried. Okay. Again. Didn't quite get it. Just like the, Bright, like, like the Wright brothers didn't get off the ground the first time. No one should come down, and especially that article. In my, the way I look at that article is like some Yahoo writing about some Yahoo, and then you got a bunch of Yahoos who run the magazine, print it. Am I offended? Yes. But on the other hand, whenever I consider the source and all the BS around it, to be offended by that, it really isn't too much. <laughs> you know, you know, someone like Attila Zola would be against me. I, that, I would feel that big time, yeah. You know, so that's not really much. You know, I remember, what was Chris's last name, the guy with that article? I know I talked to him afterwards, and he went, oh, I'd like to get your views, Carl. I said, yeah, you'd like to get my views. Why didn't you get my views before you started all that? No. He wanted to come down here and take pictures and sit around and talk to me about all this stuff. You know. Well, I'm not going to go any more on that. That's, I think you people heard enough about me and my dislike for that article. But, you know, again, when you're trying to do something the first time, it's not easy. You know, and the word yes doesn't come into play very often in the, uh, under situations like that. You know, in fact, the word yes is my most unfavorite word. <laughs> no is a much, a much more positive. I don't know if I ever mentioned that to you people before, but my favorite, I think the most positive word in the English language is no. 
Because with no, you get a real yes. If you're sitting there saying yes all the time, you got no place to go. Oh, isn't this nice? Isn't that nice? Oh, yeah, no. No, it's not. No. No will get you a yes. I can't imagine how many times Tom has said to someone. Every time I look at the light, I think of that guy, you know. You look at that light up there and you say, wow, that's, that's pretty heavy, man. How many times did he say no? When you think he just got the first one, he made a little spark. Oh, that's good. I, that, that's good enough. No, it's not good enough. You want more than that. you got to have more than that. If you keep saying no, you'll get a real yes. I'm not talking about negative. I'm talking about no. <laughs> I know that's everybody thinks no is a negative word. Eh, hell no. No, not at all. Anyway, I think that's it for that. Okay, let's take a little break, okay? We're on. Okay, I just um, been on pause there for a minute. I just wanted to close that thing about that six string article. Um, two things in closing. For those of you who don't know Anthony, uh, Mr. Jackson, um, I don't have that magazine here. I was looking for it. I know I have it. I might have taken it home. It, it's, that's, that's possible, I guess. <clears throat> but anyway, um, there's a picture in that article. On, uh, it was December sometime. I did. Not sure what year, a couple of years ago now, I guess. Here's a picture of Anthony, and if you want to know who Anthony was, or is, just take a look at that picture. I think Dave said he's going to look it up and, and uh, put it on for me. All right, that's it, Joe. Thanks. Yeah. Um, also, the other thing I wanted to say in closing, definitely, and this is it, I won't say any more on that article. There was a lot of dead notes. Because <laughs> Anthony kept talking about dead notes on the base. Well, that article sure was full of a lot of dead notes, that's for sure. Okay, that's it for that. Then we're going to take a little pause one more time. Can we pause just one more time? <laughs>